You're listening to Toronto's number one real estate podcast, powered by Watson Estates. The most successful local real estate investing starts right here, right now. Here's your host, broker, investor, and social media influencer, Bradley Watson. Good morning, investors. Bradley here from Watson Estates. It is a beautiful Thursday morning, May 29th, 2020. I woke up this morning and I have a crazy day ahead of me. I got to book a whole bunch of appointments. I got a bunch of listings and there's nothing more. There's no better way to relax than to sit and prepare a podcast for you guys. That is until I take a look at the news and it is going crazy out there, guys. I honestly need to apologize. I simply cannot keep up. There is a crazy amount of info out there. There's a lot of news. And it's a good thing we're doing this daily because I can at least pick up the pieces where they've left off. Today we're going to cover some very broad topics, but I also want to share my insight into the market. And we have some clickbaity news at that. What do economists believe will happen to prices? We're going to look at the top story of the day, torontostories.com. Their article was called Canadian Economists Forecast Property Prices in Toronto to Fall 12.55%. So we're going to look at that. What do they have to say? Should we believe them? Maybe we won't believe them. But we might as well listen either way. And then we're going to jump in and talk about how can we ease the pain of rent evictions starting up again. So we know we've talked in past podcasts that this could be a real issue with this stockpile of rent evictions piling up. Is there maybe an idea that we can have proposed? And there's been one that's been said by a few people who kind of did the survey. So we'll talk a little bit about what they're suggesting and we'll discuss my thoughts on it. And then what is happening with new homes sales? So we've kind of talked about builders and as they're building, there's been a little bit of of slowdown, but yet there's kind of this image of things going smoothly. I want to talk about what are the actual home sales? Are they selling or are they not? Because that would dictate whether they actually build, because if you can't sell, you're not going to build. Anyways, we are number one on Google Podcasts for Toronto real estate. Make sure you hit that subscribe button. Give us a thumbs up. If you're listening to us on wherever you're listening to us, give us the support. Give us the love. Thank you for the warm fuzzies. I am human too. There are feelings on the other end of this mic. In fact, I actually got a really cool note this morning waking up. It's kind of uplifting. It's encouraging because doing this on a daily basis can get a little bit tiring. And to see that there's a lot of value coming out, I actually got a, a comment from Alpha Team Racing on YouTube. Shout out. And he said, hey, Bradley, I'm new to your channel. I subscribed. Why? I like your content and full on analysis of the topics. Also, you have a sprinkle of good humor. <laughs> that's not, that's funny. I, I wasn't sure if you guys liked it. So that's good. That's good. My two-year-old laughs, but I think it's just because she wants me to like her. Your genuine approach is much appreciated in the sea of clickbaity, overdone, rinse-repeat general topics and reactions that other real estate channels come cover over and over again. Looking forward to your next video. Cool. Thank you. Thumbs up to you. I'll send you uh, send you a thumbs up today because like this is great. I appreciate the, the love and support, even phone calls I get and kind of helping people in their scenarios that have listened to our podcast and are open to general insight. You know, like it's funny. I sometimes feel bad because when someone calls and asks for my feedback or thoughts on something, I sound the same as the podcast. And I, I kind of feel bad because it's like I want to give you something new, you know, but the reality is, is when I'm sharing with you guys in this podcast, what I'm sharing is my thoughts. So if you want my thoughts again, feel free to contact me and I'm happy to help anybody in their situations. So let's jump right into this number one article of the day coming from Toronto Stories. And it is relatively grim. If you're looking for uh, a happy thought related to our real estate market today, maybe jump forward 10, 15 minutes. You're not going to want to hear this part of the podcast. But I think even though I am optimistic about our marketplace that we need to hear it and we need to go through what they're saying and why they're saying it, because let's face it, as investors, if we can find an opportunity to to buy something at a discount, I want to know. It's previously been announced that the number of new homes being built and sold, as well as home prices in Canada, are expected to fall. Oh, well, that just blew my third topic. We'll get there in a minute, guys, talking about the, the sales of new builds as a result of COVID. And now it's being said that we can expect property prices to fall to da, da, da. next week. The Bank of Canada is set to release its latest policy rate decision. And in the lead up to the announcement, Finder.com has released the results from a recent survey conducted that featured forecasts from 15 Canadian economies, economists. I don't know who these people are, but we do know economists, even though they're smarter than I am, smarter than you guys are. 
their bias and they have their own perspectives, but they kind of pooled 15 of them. So that's cool. That levels the playing field a little bit. And the majority of them actually anticipate that the overnight rate on June 3rd will remain as is. So we're not looking to see any interest rates cuts, but of the 10 panelists who gave property forecasts, the average economist, I love how it says that of the 10 panelists who gave property price forecasts, so not every, or all 15 wanted to, obviously there's a bunch that didn't. The average economist believed a property price decrease of just over 8% would be seen across Canada's major cities. Well, that doesn't sound so fun. And then they actually go on to say how in Vancouver and Toronto, respectively, you're going to see declines of 12.65 and 12.55. And so that doesn't seem so hot. In fact, it seems worse closer to the city. And so they go on to explain why, which, which I appreciate. And we'll talk about some of the things that I see as red flags in our marketplace, just from you know pooling these this information, and you, this isn't new information, but it's evolving. It's evolving quickly, actually. Again, to the point where I can't even keep up. Finder says a likely contributor to declining property prices can be linked to an increase in mortgage arrears. Okay, that's one big flag. We're gonna cover all the flags in a minute, but hold on to that one because we've been talking about. We talked about this two days ago. I, I hinted that you're gonna be hearing a lot of news from the banks. And I'm going to give you another one today, but there's been more than one came out. This is where I'm saying I can't keep up, but we're, we're seeing this kind of avalanche of banks with bad news relating to mortgage arrears, which in Canada currently sits at 0.2%. We've talked about this before, and they were expecting it could go up to as high as 0.8. So according to these guys, they're saying, well, it's probably going to flow closer to 0.6. And, but if you average it out, it's going to be closer to 0.8. So they're actually saying that the based on what we've kind of heard from CMHC and this idea of the, the falling of arrears, which was the reason CMHC had such a gloomy perspective. If you're going to say, well, okay, well, I, and I, I'm, I'm the first to do this because I'm overly critical about all sides. But if you're just to say, yeah, well, that's extreme example. And, and you know, in a best case scenario, it's, it's going to look way better. Well, according to the economists, they tend to lean more on the worst case scenario as being true. And so maybe there's some legitimacy to this. So yesterday, because I, I want to make sure you guys are getting, we're hearing the news, we're hearing the stats, but I want to share with you what I'm experiencing because what's going on around us is quite different and it's, it's very vast as it relates to small condos in the city versus low rise units. Yesterday we put in an offer on a low rise unit, beautiful unit. It's funny how everybody wants the same one unit, right? It's kind of like you go into a bar, there's four guys and there's, there's four girls. Okay, this is, I don't know if this is 2020 approved, but it doesn't matter. All four of those guys are interested in one of those girls. No offense, ladies, you're all beautiful, but we're all, we're all interested. I say we all, wow, let's not put myself in those shoes. I'm married, taken off the market, ladies, hands off. But the four guys are all interested in one lady, right? And so the problem is they end up shooting themselves in the foot, chasing the one. And this is what happens in the property market. Everyone falls in love with the one and they miss out on all the other beautiful ladies all the other beautiful properties. And in return, that one property goes through the roof in price and has a ton of competition. And this is kind of what I think we're seeing in our marketplace. This is what happens all the time, but it's just even more pronounced right now while everyone's trying to get their hands on the best property. <laughs> uh, sorry about that. Okay. But I think people are warming up to this idea, this new freak out scenario. I, I'm noticing that there's kind of this trend with the news outlets being more and more comfortable with saying there's a problem, right? Like there's a, there's a big pitch in people saying like, and, and, it, and real estate agents are the worst for this is like always selling the good news only and mentioning the bad news, but highlighting the good news. And I do this too, especially when we're, and I think it's because we're genuinely optimistic. I, I do believe that, at least that's the case for me. I like to think that's the case for everyone around me. But the idea is I think people are getting more familiar with, well, maybe we should be looking for opportunities here. Like not to say it's gonna crash, but let's consider if it does, how can we win, right? Like just because things come down doesn't mean it needs to be a problem for you and your family. This could be the greatest thing since sliced bread. Buy and hold strategy usually wins. So I actually had a comp uh, conversation with uh, a listener yesterday. It was a great chat. Talked for probably half an hour, just giving some insight into their particular scenario. And my advice, and I'll share it with you here today, because why not, is generally speaking, if you're a property investor, your best case scenario for the sake of saving expenses and fees and, and missing out when things are happening, especially if you're not in tune with what's going on in the market, is always to buy and hold. 
that is that strategy is tried and true it works in the stock market works in properties this is how we do it this is how i've been able to generate wealth this is how most of my most wealthy clients generate extreme wealth however if you want to play around now is a good time right like if you're if you're kind of like i'm a home flipper i'm one of these guys that's just want to like i'm ready to play bigger stakes because i think there's a bigger opportunity here and i am convinced without a shadow of a doubt more than any other of the economists by the way because nobody's 100 percent. but if you're relatively confident then depending on the market you're in there is a great opportunity right now and this comes down to the different segments and where you stand and so like i would say for example in this low rise segment that i'm looking at there's a really good price discount right now which is why we're seeing a lot of activity however on the low rise or sorry on the high rise condos they're a dime a dozen and so you could even make the argument there might be a buying opportunity in there the question is is will it continue will there be a better buying opportunity in a few months so timing the bottom all of these things, this is left up to you guys. Ultimately, I can I can give my two cents on what I'm seeing, and absolutely there's a buying opportunity right now, almost across the board in Toronto. Outside Toronto, not so much, but in the city, absolutely. And anyways, that's my thoughts on those. So if you have a specific market or inquiry or area you wanna reach out to me, by all means. If, I, if I'm not doing a showing, I'll pick up the phone. In fact, yesterday I was trying to get in a bit of a nap. It was kind of awkward. The lady called me and she's like, what are you doing? I'm like, uh, I was trying to nap. <laughs> <laughs> uh, try to get some shut eye because I knew today was going to be nuts. And I, of course, I didn't get any shut eye, but that's okay. And I do agree that from what I'm hearing, that there is a stronger argument for downside, at least in specific marketplaces, right? So in these condos, for example, there is room, there is a lot of people forecasting a downside. And the upside, even if there is an upside in the short term, is going to be short lived. So wait, I don't even know if I said that right. In the short term, your upside's not going to be there that much, right? So in the next year or so, are you going to see drastic increases? Let's say, let's say in a best case scenario, we see 5% increase. But in a worst case scenario, we could see 15%, right? 10 to 15. So some people would say, oh, well, I like my odds of just kind of holding the cash and seeing what happens and willing to take that risk. The risk of not paying down your mortgage, just costs associated with that move too. So it's a high risk one. Anyways, I'm rambling a little bit and I apologize. But these are some of my thoughts on what's been going on. These are conversations that I'm having with people around me. But then we kind of look at realtors not buying CMHC's nightmare scenario. It's come from Bib.com. This came actually out of Vancouver. Just to bring everybody up to speed on the news we've talked about about CMHC, because we talk about them a lot, but I don't want to forget what they've said. They released a housing forecast on May 27th that envisioned a nightmare collapse of the housing market with national sales dropping up to 29% starts plunging by 50 to 70 percent and average house prices dropping as much as 18 percent with no real recovery until 2022 so that's the news that's why everyone's talking about this because that's that's exceptional news like crazy so my friend elton ash he's a well to a western canada executive vice president of remax i like this i was thinking of like i like to make fun of names there's been so many good names my name is so boring I, when I read these articles, I feel my name is so boring. No wonder I'm not in the, the newspapers. My name is so boring. Anyways, this guy's name's Elton Ash. Think of it this, guys. I'm driving down the street. I see this fire. If there's a fire sale, you're sure to find Ash. <laughs> oh, so clever. I wish, I wish I had that kind of originality in my name. I've got the slogans. Just don't got the name to back it up. We are currently seeing inquiries from home buyers up 5% from pre-COVID levels. So again, they're saying what I'm saying. There's a lot of activity going on. There's a lot of showings. There's a, like, I'm not seeing a bottom falling out. Like, I'm not seeing that. I don't know, man. I don't know. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe the news is wrong. Maybe we're all wrong. To see the price drop that CMHC is suggesting is unrealistic, Ash said. He sees downward price adjustments in BC of perhaps 5% to 10%, depending on the region. So single digit declines, right? So, which is the best case scenario. And if we're already kind of just below zero, then, I mean, things are kind of where they're going to land, really. Then there's this chief economist of, R of BC's Real Estate Association called the BCREA. And they expect a sales recovery to begin in the second quarter, which is now. And super low mortgage rates and pent up demand is what's gonna kind of drive it. This will have more of an impact on the rental housing market rather than those buying homes. So what he's saying here is the jobs that have been lost, the majority of them are on lower end income levels and those people aren't buying homes. So as a result, the impact is gonna happen in the rental space. So once again, I'm sorry people in the rental space right now, it is bad, it is rough. So here's my list, okay? You've heard a few of them sprinkled in here, but here's my list. 
of things that I'm watching, red flags that could take place. And the list is getting longer as time goes on because I'm getting more news and I'm learning too. The first one, talking about eviction ban removal. We're going to we're going to talk about this in a minute. I'm going to share an article with you on how to try and come up with a solution to fix this. But there are tens of thousands. We don't know for sure, but speculating up to 50,000 eviction bans on hold right now because people aren't paying the rent. And that could cause a problem, right? If not addressed, that could be a red flag. The other one is mortgage arrears, which is what we're going to see later as well in this podcast, this idea of banks are freaking out. They're having to put a whole bunch more in reserve, not sure if people are going to be able to pay when their deferrals, the mortgage deferrals stop because we've pretty much kicked the can down in a lot of ways on that. And then short-term rentals is another red flag. They're, they could hypothetically convert into listings. And I can see this happening. I'm not hearing about this in the news. Actually, I haven't heard this anywhere in the news, by the way. This is just something that I've kind of thought. Knowing the the long-term rental is difficult and the short-term rental is failing, they might jump all the way to listings. And if that happens, we'd see an influx, I think, of about 6,000 Airbnbs was the numbers that I've heard thrown around. And then the fourth and final and most catastrophic wave of all is a second wave leading to repeat closures. If we see repeat closures, that would freak people out. The psychology of the issue is way worse than the actual fact. And if people think prices are going to go down, it's going to be composed. That's actually, I'm more scared of people thinking the market's going to do poorly than the economy doing poorly, because that's what causes these crazy shocks that we've seen in the last few years. It's crazy. It happens in the stock market too. The, the perception or the psychology is often what drives the market, not the facts, not the stats, not the strength of the economy. Those things are secondary and they actually fall. They follow the perception. It's a really weird dynamic that we're seeing. It doesn't line up with the fundamentals of business at all. But anyways, okay. That was our article of the day. Nice small walk in the park guys. And this is one article. I'll honestly, I could have chosen from 10 articles today, but instead we're going to stick with three topics and try and keep it simple. Give you some of the best stuff that I'm seeing. But I, w- I, I, again, I apologize. I wish I could keep up. We're going to, if anything, if we get some slower news later in the week, I can circle back and share some of the stuff. But lots of good stuff and the most important stuff. That's what you're getting here. Study urges target targeted rent relief return to rent controls to help Ontario renters keep home. So now let's kind of talk about this first red flag, this eviction ban removal. The idea that you've got the stockpiling of evictions. So there was a study that happened here. They called it the eviction prevention plan. And they're urging the province to establish this thing that includes targeted rent relief, a slow lifting in the eviction ban, and a return to rent controls. Good old rent controls. And that that would move to enable Ontario tenants to stay in their homes during COVID-19. So the idea is we don't want this influx. Nobody wants that influx, by the way, because let's face it, I don't want your dirty tenants. Keep your damn dirty tenants. Work with them. Keep them in there. That sounds really cold to people who are tenants. I love you guys. You're great. You're cool. All right. But the reality is, is this is going to look really bad for the landlords, the tenants, you're going to have a heyday. In fact, you guys, even if you don't get evicted, you might have an opportunity to run out there and get yourself a nice deal, but you didn't hear that from me. Okay. Based on the latest figures, 43% of Ontario renters have less than a month's worth of savings and 45% are paying more than 30% of their incomes in rent. All of this to say that, where's the numbers here? We'll get to there in a second, I guess. But once the eviction ban is over, tenants who are in arrears will be at risk of immediately immediate eviction for non-payment of rent, right? That's the way things are set up. In fact, we've even seen Ford through the NVP document we looked at yesterday saying that they're going to make it even easier, right? We're going to make it super easy. We're going to kick you all out, you bunch of idiots. Pay your rent, damn it. But these guys are stuck, right? Like whatever their reasoning, it doesn't matter if you didn't pay your rent, get out. It's a business decision because you haven't been able to do it currently. And there were people who got caught before the ban happened, by the way. This isn't a new issue necessarily. The trio proposed, this is three people that came up with this thing, that an emergency rent relief support program for low and middle income renters should be tied to local median market rents and could support up to 340,000 households. So whenever the government does this, it never seems to work out. But the suggestion is ultimately, let's find the people that are kind of low to middle income renters and we'll just support those guys. And then the ones that are making a whole bunch of bank, you guys, you go, you're on your own, right? So we're going to help this group and, and not everybody. That's kind of been the proposal and that's the the support. This is the programs that have been proposed. I I haven't seen any others. This is the first one I'm seeing now quote, the province has committed 241 million in support to commercial tenants, but there is no similar initiative for households. In other words, well, he got a Christmas gift. Where's my Christmas gift? 
These selfish kids expecting gifts at Christmas. It's like, you got it. I want it. I guess we should be giving our kids gifts at Christmas. But you know how you kind of like give an ice cream to one kid? You can't give it to one without the other. I only have one child at this point. But here's here's actually a fun fact. I, my wife is due within the next month. So if I all of a sudden drop off the face of the earth and you're like, where did Bradley go? Well, that's where I went. I went to the hospital. <laughs> The report notes that eviction bans put in place across Canada have enabled emergency shelter in place orders and essentially without a concerted public policy response to prevent rent arrears, governments will be enabling large scale evictions. The human cost will be immeasurable. The downstream financial cost will be considerable. The report goes on to note. That's how I picture it being said. That's how it would be said at a podium in an election. In other words, in good economic times, nearly half of tenant households live paycheck to paycheck. There's the numbers. Half of them are paycheck to paycheck. So tenants are getting screwed. I mean, there's a reason that there's a problem. And the problem is that the tenants are getting screwed too. Everybody's getting screwed here. And so the question is, is is there going to be a bailout? The CERB is a good emergency support system. We've seen it. It's not enough. Even for the average unit in Toronto as a single person, it would not be enough. And they go on to mention how we talked about this as well. BC actually had a temporary rental supplement program. And they were early out of the gate. They were actually very early. We're super late. If we do do anything, we're so late. After passing eligibility criteria, a 25% decrease in employment income, for example, eligible households receive $300 a month if there's no dependents and $500 a month if there are. So they're not giving everything, but they're giving something. It's kind of like a top up, if you will, depending on if you're single or if you have dependents or whatever your criteria looks like to try to support. That's a good idea. Like, I don't know why that hasn't already happened at a minimum. Like there's been nothing happened. So anyways, this is the problem, guys. You've got on the backdrop of these these risks right now of these major red flags that at work at play and something could trigger, something could come up, just un- undo our market. At the same time, all these programs that have been released with good intentions are failing. Like they are failing. Let's be honest. We've seen that time and again. Um, so, so do we fix them? Do we replace them? Something's got to give. And hopefully it's not our real estate prices. Okay. Now, I want to jump into, in a second, we're going to talk about new construction, but I have to highlight this because I mentioned it in the beginning of our podcast. The second red flag is this idea of arrears falling apart. Here's on on Tuesday, two days ago, we were talking about, I can't remember, I think it was Scotiabank. One of these banks announced these bad loans, like this fear of like profits are going to fall apart, and they were. And now we're seeing it in other banks too. I think BMO had it. I think CIBC. I don't even know which banks. I can't keep track. There's so many of them out there. I mean, there's only like five or six, but whatever. I don't have time. Again, the news is the news is coming by so quick. I don't have time to keep track of who's released what. But as we expected on Tuesday, there's been more banks announcing this thing. So here's the article from cbc.ca. CIBC profit falls 70% as bank sets aside five times more money to cover bad loans. That's a big number. They reported a 70% slump in quarterly profit on Thursday as it set aside more money to cover potential loan losses from the coronavirus pandemic. CIBC set aside $1.41 billion in the quarter for future loan losses compared with $255 million a year earlier. So that's a lot. <laughs> I mean, what's the math on that? That's four or five times. That's five times their amount that they had last year. And this is them protecting themselves. Now, all these loans, are they all going to go bad? No, but they're protecting their people and they're making sure they've got enough of a nest egg because they're thinking something's going to happen and how bad it is, that's to be determined. And we're going to keep monitoring that because I think you're going to see more banks with those announcements. And I think you're going to start to see articles in the mainstream. Other than these one-off articles, you're going to see ones that say, okay, now we've got everybody's. This is this is the scoop. And when we get that, of course, I'm, we're going to announce it here on Toronto's number one real estate podcast as well. So let's, as a third topic, I want to talk about this idea of new homes. There's an article that came out. This actually was from Better Dwelling. I can't, I couldn't take a full Better Dwelling article with all the craziness today, but I took a highlight from it because I think it's good. Only 5% of Greater Toronto new homes sold last month. And one of the sections was called the worst April for Greater Toronto new home sales since 2000. This is what it said. Greater Toronto new home sales cooled to the worst April on record. Total new home sales were 771 units in April, down 80% from last year and 78% below the 10-year average. Breaking it down. So here's what we want to know. Single family units represented 301 of those sales, down 62%. And 79% below the 10-year average. Condo apartments represented 407 units down 85%. So from as a, from the perspective of new homes, single families are selling down 62%, but condo apartments are selling down 85%. Why is that? God only knows. 
but this is what we're seeing. And we're seeing this very similar trend in the resale as well. Condo apartments are getting completely spanked and so are the high-end homes. They've gotten completely spanked. That kind of middle, that missing middle, that's where I see there being a big opportunity. This is what I was saying to the lady yesterday and I, I think I'm gonna keep saying this. In the city, I think if you can find a spot in the missing middle, I think you've got a very good short-term opportunity. We're talking backyard, three-bedroom unit. They are very competitive right now, but the reason they're competitive is, is they're, they're at a good price. And so to summarize that, sales of condo apartments were falling much faster than detached homes. That's what's going on. So that's the latest. That's what's been going on in our real estate market. Some fun facts for you. Again, if you guys want to send me a warm fuzzy, please do. If you have any questions relating to your marketplace, again, feel free to reach out anytime. I'm here to help you guys. I'm here to serve you guys in any way that I can. It's been fun and I will see you guys again tomorrow morning with more. Take care and keep it real.